Uh, so what I'll talk about today is uh, whether the EU incentive for drug repositioning has been effective. Fortunately, Trevor Cook has already introduced the IP that I want to analyse today. He described the 8 plus 2 plus 1 formula. And what I'll focus on is the plus 1, which is a specific type of regulatory IP for incentivising drug repositioning. I'll touch more on the specific details of that formula in a moment. The big idea, though, that I really want to draw your attention to is that the PLUS One commenced in November 2005. And I've assembled all and analysed all the drugs that have been authorised and repositioned since the EMA began in 1995. This means I have a data set of repositioned drugs before and after the exclusivity began, which means we can judge, in a way, whether it's been effective. Only a, handful of data, uh, only a handful of people have seen this data, and I'll want to engage you all in really working out what that means. I warn you now, too, that like Matteo, I'll ask for some audience participation. Um, but let's see. I, I expect maybe there'll be some more responses than our students. Right. So the plan for today, uh, first of all, I'll go into some definitions um, that are the key to really the method that I'll apply. I'll look at the incentives for drug repositioning, and I'll look at what's called the repositioning problem. I'll also look at some procedural aspects and historical notes on the PLUS One that I think you'll find very interesting. In the methods of results section, I'm going to work towards answering two questions. One, has the PLUS One increased the proportion of repositioned drugs? And then secondly, has the PLUS One increased the number of times drugs are repositioned? Because some drugs, as we'll see, are actually repositioned quite a number of times. In the conclusion, draw some policy implications with your help, and canvas some reform options, probably without deciding on any specifically. Right, so the background. What is drug repositioning exactly? I'm going to be talking about developing new uses, or what's known as medical indications, for already authorised drugs. I don't really need to put already in there, but I'm just emphasising this. They are already authorised. What I'm not talking about today is drug rescuing, when a drug was unsuccessfully developed for one use, one medical indication, and then rescued and successfully developed for another. Why do we care about repositioning? In a nutshell, it's cheaper, faster, and safer. Estimates on developing new compounds, they range 600 million to 2.5 billion US dollars. There's a lot of debate there, a lot of money. <coughs> So, but repositioning costs about 25 to 30% of that price, so 70% cheaper. It's also safer because, of course, the drug's being used. We know a lot of about its safety profile. What is a new indication exactly? I want to spend a little bit of time here. And to understand this question, we must first appreciate that medical indications are often much more specific than just treating a condition or a disease. They include things, and they, especially for cancers, they include things like age range, symptoms that people are suffering, line of treatment, that is, they, this drug can only be used after one, two, three, or four have failed, or only as an adjunct. So they're very specific, and they also include things like patient characteristics, obesity, for example. This is included in the indication. What a new indication for the purposes of the legislation is any expansion of that. So, for example, if a drug can only be used initially in anyone over the age of 35, and then it's repositioned for anyone over the age of 30, that is a new indication for the purpose of the legislation, just as taking a drug that treated epilepsy to, say, treating pain is a new indication as well. OK. The repositioning problem. So generally, we've covered this, so I'll try and do it quite quickly. The prospect of selling drugs in competitive marketplace without IP is regarded as an insufficient because competitors can copy and then place their drugs on the market, probably for a cheaper price without incurring all the development costs, a phenomenon, a phenomenon commonly known as free riding. So the pharmaceutical industry is generally seen as the classic example for patent protection. And for new compounds, it arguably works quite well, or probably works quite well. The situation is different for repositioning, though. The claims that we'll see on specific repositioning, they're often quite weak, often what we call second medical use patents. They have quite narrow protections, often limited to the use, and they're often found invalid for a number of reasons. Then, if they are found valid, 
there's often challenges to enforcement. A phenomenon commonly known as cross-use can arise, in where a generic version that hasn't been authorised for the new indication, or at least on the label of the generic, is still dispensed for the repositioned indication. This happens due to the way that drugs are prescribed, dispensed and reimbursed. I won't go into the details of that. We know this phenomenon of cross-use is common, but actually we don't know how common exactly. Right, so cross-label use. So a, a case in point on this is, of course, just to illustrate, is our favourite Warner, Lambert and generics. The decision concerned a second medical use patent for the drug pregabalin. I sh I'm going to go through this because I assume some people in this room aren't so familiar. The claims in the case were for treating neuropathic pain and pain in general. The pa but the patent was originally uh, claimed for epilepsy. The, court, the UK Supreme Court invalidated the claims on the grounds of plausibility. The patent showed that pregabalin was effective at treating inflammatory pain in mice, but the majority stated the pain in mice was only implausibly linked to neuropathic pain or pain in general, so it was found invalid. The majority continued on to say that even if, even if the patent was valid, it was not infringed by generic pregabalin when it was sold with a skinny label, and a skinny label being that it was only, the label on the generic said it was only authorised for epilepsy. So they found that even that infringement couldn't be found against the generic in these circumstances because of the outward presentation of that generic drug. So people have argued, and in particular, uh, Alistair Breckenridge, the former chair of the MHRA, and Sir Robin Jacob, the former Court of Appeal judge, argue that cross-label use and these issues with uh, invalidity is so significant that we should reform dispensing to solve the cross-label use problem, and we should extend regulatory exclusivities to increase the incentive here. While we're talking about incentives, we need to appreciate, though, what are the incentives in this space? All right, so I just said that patents were perhaps part of the problem in not incentivizing repositioning. But at the same time, um, in another branch of the work we've been doing, we've actually found that patents are applied for, second medical use patents are applied for at an increasing rate. Um, Matteo has been leading this work with us. So although they, there's concerns about enforcement and validity, they're applied for and they at an increasing rate, an increasing amount, and they, they therefore must offer something. But other incentives and competitive advantages we're talking about are market demand, scientific lead time, because the firm already knows, the pharmaceutical company already knows something about the drug, they have distribution networks, they have obliged drug surveillance due to the, the drug, the use they already have on market, relationships with regulators, relationships with reimbursement authorities, there's also likely to be some trade secrets, perhaps in manufacturing and development, and of course there's brand power, the drug is on the market. The other incentive is of course what I want to focus on, the eight plus two plus one. The eight being data protection, two years of market protection, and the plus one. Let's look at that in a bit more detail. Regulation 726, 2004, Article 1411 says that market protection for authorised drugs shall be extended by an extra year if during the first eight years of market protection, I need you to remember that, first eight years of market protection, the marketing authorization holder obtains an authorization for one or more new therapeutic indications. And we've already investigated what a new therapeutic indication is. Which bring significant clinical benefit in comparison with existing therapies that was covered by Trevor. Right. So now I'm just going to scoot through some historical notes. There was no incentive for repositioning prior to Regulation 726 2004. It was confirmed in R and the Licensing Authority in 1998. A 2000 EU Commission report expressed concern about the lack of protection for significant new clinical indications. But at the same time, the report admitted that there was very little hard evidence to support implementing an incentive for repositioning. Then, um, well, sorry, a bit of a delay there. The, in the European Parliament, Commissioner Lykkonen argued that the plus one was the right balance between incentivising innovators for new, uh, new indications and allowing generic access, even though there wasn't much data. But we often make these decisions based on, well, talking to people and gut instincts, perhaps. Procedural aspects of the plus one. The plus one is only available for drugs applied for after 20 November 2005. 
I'm not talking about repositioning. I'm talking about the primary authorization when the drug was first authorized. Repositioning comes later. The drug authorization holder must apply for the plus one when they apply to reposition the drugs, including information on how they meet the significant clinical benefit test. The plus one can only be obtained once per drug. Right, so moving into the method now. The first stage of this method is that I download an EMA database of all the medicinal products authorized in the EU via the centralized procedure. This, obtained, this gave pan-EU rights. It began in 1995, and when I downloaded it mid last year, it consisted of 1,565 products. I then removed all the irrelevant entries, such as generics, veterinary drugs, and diagnostics, etc., leaving 742 drugs. In addition, the EMA maintains a web-based European Public Access Report, an EPA as it's commonly called, for each drug. And then within that EPA, they record all of the repositioning. The second stage of this method is where I split it up to answer those questions that I outlined at the start. So I divide the data into two groups. We have the drugs applied for before 20 November 2005, and then the after group, drugs applied for after 20 November 2005. And then to answer this first question of whether it's increased the proportion, count the proportion that are repositioned at least, at least once in the group. Importantly, repositioning only counts for the purposes of this analysis if it occurred within the first eight years of the primary authorization. To answer the second question, has it increased the number of times drugs are repositioned? I use the same grouping, before and after is for the first question, but then count the average number of times a drug is repositioned, but only if it has been repositioned. Okay, now comes to the crowd participation part that I promised everyone. Or as I like to think about it, avoiding hindsight bias part, because we all know things once we've been told the results. Okay, I'm going to ask you to predict the outcomes to two questions. And yes, before you say anything, a trapdoor will open below you, unlike Matteo. Matteo was very generous. If you get the question wrong, I will open up the trapdoor. Please participate in this, it's a bit of fun. Okay, so I'd like a show of hands of whether, not the answers. And, and in fact, in your notes, don't turn the page, I've deliberately put a blank slide in there. Has the plus one increased the proportion of repositioned drugs? So I'll ask for a show of hands for increased, steady, or decrease. So, increased, raise your hand. Steady. A few less. Decreased. This is amazing crowd participation. Thank you. You guys pass. No trap doors. Okay. And secondly, what proportion of drugs, this isn't actually my second research question, but it's important for, as you'll see later on, what proportion of drugs in my most recent sample, in the after sample, do you think were repositioned? And I'll ask this increasing, in increasing increments of 12.5%. <laughs> it was just a little bit shorter. I was playing with time a bit here. Okay, so raise your hands if you think 0 to 12.5% of drugs are repositioned. 125 to 25%. That's quite a few. 25 to 37.5%. 375 to 50. 50 to 62.5, uh, 62.5 to 75, 75 plus, yeah, yeah, very good so far, no optimists in the room, okay the answers, <laughs> has the plus one increased, the, I should say, so largely people thought it would increase with um, some people thinking it would remain steady but a fewer number, very few people thought it would decrease. Um, the largest amount was, I think, around 25, between 12 to 37.5%, um, and almost no one after that. Sorry, though, I should have said that. Right, here are the answers. So, has the plus one increased the proportion of repositioned drugs? In the before group, 256 primary or drug authorizations, 108 of those were repositioned, giving a reposition percentage of 42.2. In the after group, 125 primary drug authorizations, 56 repositioned, giving a percentage of 44.8. This is nominally an increase of 2.6%, but do not pat yourselves on the back yet. Three extra drugs. I wouldn't write home about that one. 
It is not statistically significant using a chi-squared test, not even close. This suggests that what we're probably seeing there is just variation, particularly in a sort of small sample size. Another perspective on this, though, is a more <coughs> fine-grained analysis. What I've done there is I've compared the most the recent four years leading up to the commencement of the 2005 with the four years afterwards, which are actually the after group. And what we see there is that in the four years leading up to the commencement, 46.9% were repositioned, which is actually higher than afterwards. So maybe decrease is right, and I don't think anyone really gets a pat on the back. But in reality, it hasn't changed. Steady, you guys win. <laughs> Question two, has the, in, has the plus one increased the number of times drugs are repositioned? The before group, as we said before, 108 were repositioned, corresponding to 215 events, which means on average, if it was repositioned, it was repositioned twice, a ratio of two. Tiny bit of rounding there. In the after group, 56 drugs were repositioned, corresponding to 103 repositioning events, giving an average of 1.8. This is nominally a decrease of 0.2 on average, or nine, approximately nine less times drugs were repositioned. Not statistically significant, not even close. There's an interesting explanation here um, for drugs that we've already mentioned. The before group includes two drugs, Remicade and Humira, some of people's favourites, <laughs> and uh, were repositioned nine times, and another two that were repositioned eight times. The after group has no drugs that were repositioned six times or more. And what I think we're just seeing there is that a random variation, sometimes drugs are repositioned um, over time. Right, oh, I should say Humira and Remicade, they, ne they were never eligible for the plus one. They're all in the before group, initially applied for before. Policy implications. Has the plus one... One implication from these results is that the plus one is an insufficient incentive. And I would have thought everyone in this room would just say, well, plus one, who cares? I think, yep, I, I generally agree with that. Oh, sometimes I'm sure it's going to be very useful. But connected to this is the idea that other incentives or competitive advantages are generally more important. Market demand, first mover advantage, and Remicade and Humira. Humira was actually repositioned, if we include all the time up to now, 23 times. Why do they keep doing that? Well, they just expand the number of patients that can use it. Uh, we have first mover advantage. We have, there's also patterns that operate in the background of this. So there might be... Um, we could sort of think of it as overlapping protection coming from the original molecule. SPCs, same sort of analysis, even though generally Trevor's completely right that they're not going to incentivize it sort of by itself. There might be new claims on formulations, um, first medical use claims, second medical use claims, although they have those difficulties we were talking about before. But there's also patterns that could be linked to drugs with diagnostics and drugs and delivery mechanisms. There's lots of other incentives at play here. Another possibility here is that we're already seeing quite high rates of repositioning. Most of you thought it was less than 45%, but it's been 45% for a very long time. Well, actually, my data doesn't go from 2011 up till now, but again, there's, it's more challenging because I don't have that eight-year time frame to look at it, but I can tell you that it's sort of remained about the same. Another op uh, possibility here is that the cross-label use uh, undermines the utility or the incentive effect of the plus one. That is very, very possible. We know that it cross-label use occurs. But how important is it exactly? As I said, we don't actually have much data on it at all. And we also know that there's various incentives or market factors that counteract the, the cross-label effect. Originator companies sometimes produce their own generic versions of the drug. Many drugs don't have generics. The FDA maintains a, list, a database of 400 uh, market products, albeit many refer to the same compound, that do not have generics. They update it every month. Uh, originated drugs continue to sell, particularly for, for biologics, and sometimes at quite high rates. And then we also see dosage and pharmaceutical forms, which sometimes prohibit or prevent in some way the cross-label use. High or low dosages for the repositioned indication or pharmaceutical form change from cream to tablet or IV or used in a hospital, used by a GP. Right, reform options. We could increase the plus one. It's, it's probably not that much of an incentive to plus three like in the US or more. But what are the considerations here? 
know, the plus one didn't have, have effect. Why should plus three? How much, how much more would we have to increase it by? And at what cost? In my after data set, there were 14 drugs that obtained the plus one and another six that applied, applied for it unsuccessfully. The data indicates that probably, well, sorry, so we have 14 that got the plus one, but if we accept that the plus one hasn't had an effect, then these 14 drugs that obtained the plus one probably would have done their repositioning afterwards. Uh, sorry, without the benefit of the plus one. So we've just given a, a windfall to perhaps all of those 14, or maybe only 10 of them. So I think at the moment, my tentative conclusion that we should avoid increasing the plus one to plus three, unless cogent edit evidence says it will spur innovation that otherwise wouldn't occur. And importantly, and I don't know how to do this calculation, but it has to be cost effective. Let's say in those 14, that let's say four of them, only four were spurred. If the plus one didn't exist, that repositioning wouldn't have happened. But the other 10 would have happened regardless. Should we cross-subsidize those 10 with those four? Another option is to repeal the plus one. And I think this should be a definite option if we can work out how much the plus one costs. Is it 10 to hundreds of millions of euros or pounds? Or actually, in those 14 drugs that we looked at, patent protection eclipses them all. And so actually, it's not operating on the market. And so that plus one was just a backup option for those companies. Probably some research to be done there. We'd have to confirm that it isn't spurring in extra innovation. This research is not causative. It is observational. And then finally, what is the impact of cross-label use? We don't know. I would like to do some research on some people's judgments um, to instruct the NHS not to prescribe. I think some interesting work could be done there. But um, we might do that in the future. Uh, I'd like to thank my co-authors, uh, Matteo and Cathy, who you've already met, and the Nova Nordisk Foundation, our funder. Thanks.